Warning, this podcast may contain graphic and triggering content. Please listen at your own risk. Each individual struggle is different and everyone's recovery and healing journey is different. Please reach out to a certified medical professional if you need help. Welcome to episode 11 of Stomp the Stigma, the podcast aimed to fight the stigma surrounding mental health through education, awareness, experiences, stories, resources, and the vulnerable truth. Joining me to stomp the stigma today is Paige Abbott. She is a registered psychologist right here in Alberta, specializing in addiction counseling. And she's here to share her opinions and perspectives on mental health and tips and tricks to get through this third wave of COVID. Hi, Lana. Hi. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Good. Yeah, I'm kind of coming out of holiday mode to do this interview. So it felt a little bit weird because I've been on holidays for the last week. So I'm like, oh yeah, I have something kind of work related I have to do. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, I hope I'm not uh, interrupting your holidays. Oh, good. I booked it intentionally. I also have more time during my holiday time, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. that's the place I always have to make. Yeah. Nice. Well, it's so nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Um, you're the first therapist, I guess you could call it, um, that I'm going to have on. So I'm super excited to talk to you about it. So you're a registered psychologist, correct? Yeah. Um, and you specialize in addiction counseling? Yes. Okay, so a lot of people, when they hear the word addiction, they think drugs or alcohol, um, but... I know that it's so much more than that. Um, can you expand on on that and what that really means? Sure, yeah, it's been kind of an interesting transition for me because I worked at an agency for many years and their focus there was specifically around addiction. So a lot of the clients who were coming already suspected or knew or identified that they had addiction so they had an issue with a substance or a behavior that was creating problems for them Um, and then i started to do more private practice work and i found that was quite interesting because i was hearing a lot of the same challenges from people but they weren't even close to identifying a label such as addiction. So that's kind of been my own personal growth over the last, I guess, year and a half now, is trying to translate that language of addiction into Mm -hmm. the more kind of popular mental health language. Um, And I guess where I've been finding it resonates for people is talking about the overly easily attached brain. And that seems to make more sense to people than throwing out the word addiction, Mm because I do think will have a pretty limited idea of what addiction really means. Um, With addiction, you know, people may think of substance use or they think of the severe end of the spectrum. So somebody who's, you know, homeless, unable to maintain a job. Um, They've lost their family. They've lost all relationships. And so when people look at themselves, I'm a a high functioning, um, employed, relating Mm -hmm. individual. That just doesn't fit for me. But when we start to talk about this brain that gets overly and easily attached, and that can be to anything and everything. So it can be to behaviors, it can be to thoughts, it can be to memories, it can even be to feelings. I find that really starts to make more sense to people. To me, that is still at root what addiction is, Mm -hmm. because addiction is a kind of malfunction in the reward circuitry of the brain, which has other implications for our brain and behavior and functioning. But at core, what it essentially means is that our brain doesn't know when to stop something that it's been engaging in. And the brain is on that active quest for dopamine, And dopamine comes through intensity of experience. So the reality is that we don't get as much dopamine from healthier activities like 
going for a walk or talking with a friend or doing a meditation um, or when life is just pretty routine, pretty stable, pretty consistent. Our brain does get some dopamine out of that, but it does not get nearly as much as when there's chaos or when there's drama or when there's tension or when there's pain. And so our brains, even in the absence of external substances or behaviors, can actually generate that dopamine hit internally by just ruminating, dwelling on something that's really stressful, um, having you know crisis or chaos in relationship even if it's just all in our thinking, even if there's nothing external that's happened. So for me, addiction is such a far reaching issue. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason that I love working in addiction counseling is that you get to talk about absolutely everything um, doing addiction counseling, because you have to talk about feelings coping, you have to talk about all behaviors. So substance use, food, sex, relationships, work, um, shopping, gambling, caffeine, sugar, like everything. Mm -hmm. Get to talk about how people think, how they relate to people in their world, how they feel about themselves. So there's really kind of no area that you need to leave unturned when you do addiction work. So mm -hmm. for me, addiction impacts all parts of life and behavior. As I say often to clients, it's not a matter of looking at how if addiction is impacting your life. Um, it's a matter of looking at all of the different places where it's impacting. So it's not if, it's how. If you recognize that you have that easily and overly attached brain. So mm -hmm. that's, I guess, in a, a nutshell, though that was a long nutshell, um, how addiction counseling kind of operates and runs in my world, in my expertise. Um, so it can touch on basically every part of people's lives. And I guess I'll also clarify that this doesn't mean that everybody out there has addiction. I think that's another misnomer and misunderstanding. But I think most people are at varying degrees of risk of having this. So even people who haven't crossed over kind of that proverbial pickle line to having addiction will still notice some of those traits of that easily and overly attached brain and therefore would benefit from still looking at all of those areas that I mentioned before. Wow, that sounds so interesting. So fun. <laughs> How does somebody know when they have an addiction or not? Like, where, where is that line where somebody can kind of identify that? Yeah, it's a tricky line. And to be honest, I mean, there are questionnaires and criteria that have mm -hmm. been developed out there. Um, honestly, my feelings about those are pretty <laughs> meh. On the not so great side, yeah. um, I find that the questionnaires, they're pretty simplistic. They do tend to focus just on substance use. Right. Um, and even some of the like diagnostic criteria that psychiatry uses, which a lot of psychology has adopted, fortunately, unfortunately, um, I find it just looking at the impact that these behaviors and thoughts and feelings are having in people's lives. So... I don't know, for me, I've honestly never been the biggest fan of diagnosis. Um, to me, the practical part of my brain says, you know what, the solutions and the remedies and the treatment are pretty standard, mm -hmm. whether you've been officially and formally diagnosed as having something versus if you're just looking right. for personal growth and personal development. Um, but what I will say is when people are starting to notice their quality of life is being significantly impacted, yeah. when they can't yeah. live how they want to live, think how they want to think, feel how they want to feel, um, if they're finding they're progressively kind of chasing behaviors or people or things that they recognize don't really suit their values or who they are, um, mm -hmm. then those are pretty key indicators that, that that overly and easily attached part of the brain is kind of taken over and is running the show because it does start to overshadow the authentic part of the self over time. And that's when people really start to run into some difficulty. 
Okay, so you specialize in addiction counseling, but are you open to um, other types of counseling or would you refer people to someone else for that? Depends. I mean, I do also, again, as a psychologist, just working with people, Mm -hmm. um, you definitely see people who struggle with symptoms of anxiety, with depression, with grief and loss, um, with trauma. So there's lots of different pieces that, again, come with addiction counseling. Right. Right. However, it all depends on the person's goals and what they're really looking to explore. Mm -hmm. Um, So if people, say, just want to heal from their trauma, um, that's not my area of expertise. So at that point, I would refer them to somebody else or encourage them to seek out another provider. Um, Same thing if there was other specific issues that people wanted to address that I didn't really feel were kind of part of that bigger umbrella of addiction counseling. I talk about it with people and say, look, this is what we would be working on here and what we could accomplish. And then they can decide for themselves if that feels like a fit or if they're looking for a little bit of a different treatment. So it all Mm -hmm. depends on the person. Okay, good. Cool. Um, Can I ask how you became a psychologist or or how you got into this field? Sure, yeah. I was anticipating this podcast and I thought, I wonder if she'll ask me a question about how I got into this. (laughs) Do I even have an answer for that? I'm not really sure. (laughs) Some things in life just happen, right? And it's hard to remember their origins. Yeah. But I was thinking back that in... All throughout, like growing up as a little kid, I wanted to be a writer. That was my goal. That's what I wanted to do. And it was only as I was approaching applying for university that I started to rethink that because I thought, okay, practical part of my brain again. What is that going to look like? Like, mm-hmm. what are my career options as a writer? Um, I grew up in a family of accountants. I had worked briefly with them. I knew that I definitely did not want to go in that direction, um, but I could appreciate the value of like having a steady career and having mm-hmm. that stability and that safety. So I had taken psychology in high school and I really enjoyed just those intro courses. And I started talking with people and I think my current partner who I was dating at the time, he's now my husband. Um, he, I think was the one that started to put some of those seeds out there. Like, have you thought about psychology and going into being like a therapist? And then I started to think about the feedback I would get from friends and people around me. And it all centered around, you're a really great listener. So I thought, well, that would be a pretty good skill, I think, to have as a psychologist. Right. So I Um, I kind of just randomly picked it and started taking the courses and Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it. And I'm really glad that I found my way into that as a career um, because it's, I think, a really ideal place for me and my personality and just what I have to offer. Um, So I'm really happy it all worked out that way. So I'm thankful to everyone who gave me that feedback when I was younger and kind of encouraged me to go in that direction. So yeah, I started right out of high school pursuing this and I've never looked back. Wow. So you've been doing it this whole time. Yes. I mean, basically I left high school and went right into university. And Mm -hmm. so I graduated pretty young, um, which was hard. It was hard being a young psychologist. I was only in... I guess I would have been like my early to mid 20s when I graduated and was doing Mm -hmm. practicums and stuff. Um, And I got a lot of flack. I even had one client almost, she didn't quite walk out on me, but she almost walked out on me because of my age. Um, So I can definitely empathize with people who are starting off their careers Mm -hmm. that even at that time, I felt really frustrated people getting mad at me um, for being young or not having a lot of experience and I was thinking 
well, A, I can't help my age. I am how old I am. And B, how am I supposed to gain experience if people aren't willing to work with me, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful for everyone who was willing to work with me um, and has helped me to grow in my career and my expertise over the years. But yeah, it was a little bit difficult, actually, in my 20s especially. And I think it was only when I hit my 30s that I started to sort of feel that ownership, like, okay, um, my biological age is catching up to my professional goals and aspirations. So I do have a lot of empathy for young Mm. professionals who are trying to start off. Yeah, I was going to ask you if um, people had a hard time taking you seriously um, when you're that young in a field like that. Honestly, I feel like it was just those initial kind of gut reactions and initial judgments that people hold um, that was the biggest barrier Mm because... I don't know. I've not really had any evidence to counter this thought, but I think once people actually started to know me and work with me, um, that everyone, like even, even when I was 13, people thought that I was, you know, 18 or 20, like I've always been pretty, pretty wise, um, kind of an older soul as I've been described a lot of times. So I think it, it really doesn't matter about age. It's about the person and about what they're carrying, mm-hmm. um, especially in psychology and in counseling. But people just have to be willing to get past those initial biases that we all carry. Um, that, oh, that person, they have no life experience or they have nothing to offer. Yes. And I, I don't believe in any of that. I think people have the experiences they have um, and they have the wisdom that they do. That doesn't just come with age. I definitely experienced the same thing. Um, I... I worked in oil and gas before I moved into the career I'm in now. And I started when I was 19. And so people definitely looked down on me. I mean, the majority of my coworkers were quite a bit older than me. Um, And it was so hard to get people to take me seriously or think that I had anything like worthy to contribute, I guess, until I, I mean, I was there for a while. So Once people kind of saw that I knew what I was doing and I was good at my job, then um, I think Uh they started to take me seriously a little bit more. But yeah, Yeah. I definitely relate to that. Say like this could take us off in a whole bigger political conversation, (laughs) but there's a gender component to it too, right? Yeah in the field and I think in the profession of psychology and counseling um, identifying as a woman and a female actually is quite beneficial Mm -hmm. um, because I think when people are coming to a professional for sort of matters of the heart so to speak um, dealing in that emotional world I think just even men as well as women alike do seem to have more fundamental bias towards trusting a woman to do that work with. Um, And the men that I've worked with in the counseling field over the years, there was much fewer of them proportionally. Um, And I know that it was quite challenging for them to also establish that degree of rapport and trust um, with somebody. And they sometimes counseled differently than other people would. So it's just a really interesting thing how just our our biases and our judgments about people Mm -hmm. um, can impact that professional relationship. But it's definitely there. And there would be other factors as well, Mm -hmm. race, um, culture, language, like all of that stuff. It spills into this relationship just like it does to other relationships and other careers. That is such a good point that I never really thought about. But Having a female therapist, I think a lot of people would be more trusting. Um, it's kind of like a like a motherly figure or someone that they're more comfortable with versus a man. Um, so, would you say this field is is uh, female dominated? Yeah, it definitely yeah. is. I don't know how it's currently looking. Mm-hmm. Um, just kind of anecdotal observation. Yeah. It's great to see a lot more men um, come into the field but I would still say like if I just look at the colleagues who are around me um, it's definitely higher proportion to people who identify as women Mm -hmm. um, and females than men 
And even sometimes I've had conversations with clients who are men, encouraging them to seek out a male therapist because I think they would really value from actually learning mm -hmm. how to relate and connect to a man. Yeah. Um, but because of some of their own issues and biases and whatevers, um, some people, they're very direct that, no, I'm not open and willing to do that. I'm more comfortable with a woman or a female. Yeah. Okay, well, that's okay, but there can be a time and a place for learning how to relate to your own gender. Mm -hmm. And I do find that actually is a, it might seem strange, but it is one of the common symptoms that I've seen of addiction is people struggle to relate and connect to their own sex. Um, and so mm -hmm. it can be women feel more comfortable in the company of men um, often because they may be kind of engaging in a more kind of sexual flirtatious almost superficial sort of way mm -hmm. um, and they never really learned how to relate to women so they find that there's a lot of walls up when it comes to their connection with women mm -hmm. and then it can also be the flip side where men didn't really learn how to engage or connect with other men or it triggers some shame and insecurity for them so they feel more comfortable even just having female friends and female companions um, so in the therapy relationship again there can be value if you've recognized you struggle in certain types of relationships whether with the opposite sex or with same sex um, that can be a great place to challenge and learn and grow so that you can take that on the road so to speak into your day-to-day -day life wow that's so interesting yeah, it's oh pretty fascinating. Gosh. I'm learning so much today <laughs> <laughs> Um, how did you get into um, specializing in addiction versus like any other kind of brand yeah, of psychology? Yeah, that also was a bit of a fluky thing. Um, fluke from life, fluke from circumstance. Yeah. Um, I started off my career very generally. So I worked with anybody and everybody. Although now when I look back, a lot of those people that previously I thought, oh, it's anxiety or it's grief or it's, you know, a relationship conflict. Um, when I look back, I'm going, oh, yeah, OK, they had that easily overly attached brain that I call addiction. Um, but I just didn't know that at the time. Um, so I worked very generally for the first few years of my career and mm -hmm. then wasn't happy with the workplace environment that I was in went on a mat leave to have my one and only daughter a decade ago um, and I didn't want to go back to where I had left. I didn't really like the culture that was there so I started mm -hmm. seeking out some new opportunities um, and happened to find a clinic that accepted me to work there and that was their specialty um, and it it worked really well because there's also a personal connection to addiction that it's in my family pretty active um, and some part of me always knew that. Like I remember when I was, I don't know, I think even before university, um, I worked at the library and I went to the reference section. I pulled out the DSM, which is the psychiatrist manual of diagnostic labels. And I remember just flipping through to the addiction, they didn't call it addiction in there, but the substance dependence and abuse category, um, and just starting to read some of the criteria and seeking answers. And I was seeking answers about where I came from, how I grew up, what I had witnessed and experienced. Um, there wasn't a lot of answers, unfortunately, that came from those psychiatric labels and symptoms that are in there, hence why I'm not a huge fan. Um, but still, it kind of got me curious. And I think that's also part of my fundamental personality type is that I do seek to understand and I mm -hmm. seek um, that understanding of who I am, where I've come from, and also how other people think and behave and react. 
Um, so it all just pieced really nicely together how just kind of serendipitous circumstance um, paired well with what I was hoping to learn about my own background um, and where I come from. So it was a really good pairing and I really enjoy the work. It's very, like I said, it's so varying. Um, yeah. You get to deal yeah. with everything, even though it's in this area of specialty. So mm -hmm. it feels really special and it feels really unique to me. Um, and it definitely it fills me up and it gives me something that, I don't know, the, the other more general types of counseling that I was doing mm -hmm. just didn't quite hit the mark on. So I'm really grateful that I found that. Oh, I love that. Is there a part of your work that is your favorite? Oh, my brain immediately said all of it. But I thought, <laughs> oh, that sounds too cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> so I think what I really like, I love talking about relationships and I love talking about how people experience and express mm -hmm. and cope with feelings. Um, so those, I do recognize that those are pretty intense conversations and they require a lot of vulnerability from people. And so I think that's also what I really value. And that's one of the favorite parts of my work is when people are willing to show up and they're willing, they're able to have that kind of deep conversation about how they relate in the world um, and how kind of they feel about their place in the world. Um, those are the conversations I love more than anything. Um, conversations where people are looking to more kind of symptom manage and just learn some general coping strategies, definitely worthwhile doesn't quite fill me up and kind of hit me in quite the same way. Mm -hmm. um, but I love those those deeper conversations when they can happen. Yeah. And I love just meeting new people. It's really cool. Like, yeah. I think back over my career, I've probably met thousands, probably, yeah, like thousands of people yeah. um, at career by now and done tens of thousands of hours of counseling um so it's pretty cool when i think about how many of those like really deep and meaningful conversations i've been able to have with people that feels really special to me mm -hmm. okay i'm gonna switch it up a little bit um i'm really curious about hypnotherapy so to me it it just seemed like something that you'd see in movies or on TV and like not in real life. So I'm super curious like what what it's like and 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 does it really work? And does it work for everyone? So I'll start with the general principle behind hypnotherapy as I was trained in it. <laughs> um and the reason that I say that is I've known other people who I would say are more experienced in hypnotherapy. It's certainly not my area of expertise. It's kind of an adjunct tool that I learned a while ago um, that I incorporate once in a while, but it's certainly not my main method. Mm -hmm. And I have known people who practice hypnotherapy on a more kind of spiritual place, which I do think can tap into like a deeper level than even the hypnotherapy work that I do. Um, hypnotherapy kind of triggers my shame button a little bit. I don't feel it's my kind of biggest strength. Um, I don't feel it's my area of expertise. So whenever people bring it up or want to do it, I always feel that kind of little shame button come up <laughs> like, oh gosh, me? No, we can't do it together. I'm not good at this. Um, but then I have to remind myself that you have that intuitive capability, like just use that here in this context. Yeah. The idea behind clinical hypnotherapy is not to have people clucking on a stage like a chicken or doing ridiculous things to <laughs> make people laugh. Um, what I was trained, the trainer that I had done my hypnotherapy work with had said that basically in those environments, people, they're just giving themselves permission um, to do what the entertainment is suggesting that they do, um, knowing that, you know, they can do something silly, the crowd will laugh, and everyone has a good time. Mm -hmm. They had made, but I think it's a pretty good point, that if the hypnotherapy or whatever they call themselves, the hypnotizer on stage um, told someone to go hurt somebody or go do something that was against their values, people wouldn't be doing that. So with hypnotherapy, are always in 
control. They're always aware of what's going on. Um, I like to describe hypnotherapy as almost like a mental massage. So really what it is, is it's guided relaxation paired with affirmations or healthy suggestions that we want the brain to basically grab onto. So again, that easily overly attached part of the brain, usually it grabs onto dialogue that's pretty mean and that's pretty negative and unhelpful for us. And that's what people are hearing all day long, day in and day out. So the idea with hypnotherapy is that in a state of re and if we offer up in more kind of helpful suggestions to, to hear and to think about, um, and it's more likely to take that on and offer it back to us at a later time and date more automatically. So it's almost kind of like doing cognitive behavioral therapy in a more relaxed state. Um, and like I said, people generally feel like they do after a massage, kind of that little bit um, oh, kind of disconnected from the world a little bit, um, feeling like they need a good glass of water, feeling like they might need to go have a little rest afterwards. So if people have done massage, kind of like that, if people have done um, just guided meditation or imagery, relaxations, mm -hmm. it's like that. But the difference is there's the addition of the customized and personalized suggestions or affirmations that you want your brain to be offering up to you at a later point in time. Yeah. And I do believe that it's a very helpful tool to help people learn how to relax and also for people to learn helpful ways to talk to themselves because Believe it or not, a lot of people, they think that it's okay for their brain to tell them all the time what a piece of crap they are or how bad they are at doing things. Like yeah. People are just so used to that, that it's nice for them to hear some different options for their brain to be talking to them with. Um, so that's kind of the rationale behind hypnotherapy. I'm always very clear with people that it's a tool. I have therapists market it as almost kind of more of a miracle cure right, um, yeah. that it will take away addiction or it will take away cravings or people you know will be able to make significant behavioral change out of it hey if that is possible in those circumstances okay i'm not gonna say anything or debate that um, but i do have concerns about that marketing because mm -hmm. I think that that's quite dangerous for people, um, especially for people who do have addiction or that easily overly attached brain because that brain usually comes with a lot of pain and therefore people have a very strong desire for relief of that pain. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of people are coming to therapy for that quick fix, that miracle cure, and that easy solution away their pain and sorry not to sound like a Debbie Downer but I truly don't believe that that's how people change and how people grow mm -hmm. um, it requires a lot of work it requires effort and it requires ongoing diligence it's not just gonna go away all of a sudden um, so if people are open to hypnotherapy as a tool great mm -hmm. but that has to complement other work that they're doing um, or else to me i actually don't feel comfortable doing that work as a standalone because then i feel like i'm actually participating in the problem of that brain rather than trying to help people have it. so it's not like what you see in movies you're not hypnotizing this person into kind of stopping a negative um behavior or anything like that that's not my belief at all <laughs> um what a hypnotherapy session looks like in my office is somebody sitting comfortably in a chair just like they would in a counseling session eyes closed we'll have some music on and then i'm going through and reading them the hypnotherapy script um, to guide them through some relaxation, to get them to a nice relaxed state, and then reading them the suggestions that they've come up with and also ones that I will offer to them. Um, and that usually takes about 25 to 30 minutes of an appointment. 
Then I bring them back into the room just by kind of helping them to wake up and kind of come back um, to a little bit more awareness mm -hmm. and we process and debrief how that experience went and off they go with kind of the rest of their day. So again, it's a, a nice pause. It's a nice opportunity for people to look after themselves differently. Um, is it my belief that that will fundamentally change how somebody behaves or engages with something? No, um, I don't think that that's going to be it. Mm -hmm. It will require also ongoing practice. I encourage people to record their hypnotherapy sessions so that they can listen to them repeatedly because these things work by repetition. So, you know, three or four sessions of hypnotherapy is a great foundation, but people need to build on that to keep that work going with repetition of the affirmations and of the suggestions. Mm -hmm. Their brain got to that unhelpful dialogue through usually years of repetition. So we need to meet that repetition with new repetition. So during hypnotherapy, does somebody have to kind of relive um, traumatic memories or events in their lives? No. That's how I practice hypnotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are some hypnotherapists who do use hypnotherapy as more of a trauma processing tool, um, okay. but that is not the kind of work that I do or how I practice hypnotherapy. Hmm. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Yeah. I know not everyone has a mental illness, but obviously everyone has mental health struggles of their own and oftentimes we overlook the fact that our therapists are not invincible so um how do you take care of your own mental health sure it's actually funny you bring this up before um we met i was just looking at i can't forget what social media platform, um, but it said that your therapists are burnt out too. And it was connecting it to yeah. what's going on with COVID. And I kind of smiled I'm like, yes, we are people too. <laughs> so thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah. And I think for therapists who have been in the field for a while and want to continue being in the field for a while, um, mm -hmm. what I've noticed is that we are vigilant about our self-care um, and I I have become so proprietary over the years about my self-care I'm like a mama lion with it man um, that I am not willing to sacrifice on certain things mm -hmm. so for me it kind of changes over the years like journaling is a tool I've used since I was six years old. Like I had my first journal when I was in grade one um, and it's so cute. It's just writing about, you know, going to a friend's house and stuff like that. But yeah. it was a really cool tool to start processing. Um, and that tool, it's gone on and off for me over the years, but I have a journal, I have it kind of sitting. And if there's certain days where intuitively I'm feeling like I want to write, um, sometimes those are great days and I just want to reinforce the gratitude and the joy mm -hmm. that I'm feeling. Yeah. Other days, they've been harder days, so I want to kind of process and debrief on there. Um, there have been times I've been very diligent, like doing journaling every day. Um, but right now, I'm, I'm not feeling that I need that as much as a tool. And I'm okay to use it when I feel that I need it. But journaling is one for me. Um, meditation, I start off my day with a, a brief, about five minute, just kind of meditation to help me transition into the day. Um, I have a pretty good, solid structure and routine, which I think is also really important for mental health. Like I generally know what I'm going to be doing and when I'm going to be doing things so that my brain feels that sense of safety and stability. Um, the people that I'm surrounded by are super important. Um, I've had to make some really difficult choices over the years, uh, letting go of certain relationships that were just not serving me whatsoever yeah. Yeah. Um, and really detracting from my mental health. Um, so that's something, again, I'm really vigilant about, um, that if I'm feeling not comfortable, not safe, um, not authentic, like I can be myself in a relationship, then I step back. Um, and I may not let go of that relationship completely, but I'll definitely reevaluate my boundaries there. Fun. I love to be silly. Um, I am viewed as a pretty serious person. So a lot of people, they have a hard time 
and recognizing that silly part of me. And yeah. I think I do keep it a little more private. Um, I have a 10 year old daughter and she's been amazing at bringing out the silly kind of playful part of me. So we play, we play figures, um, we play silly games. I sometimes find myself just skipping when we're going out for a walk down the street and just being a total goof. Um, so I love doing stuff like that. I've always loved just kind of singing and moving my body in kind of a dancing kind yeah. of fun way. Um, body movement is by far like my main thing that I need to keep myself kind of sane and level. So every day, you know, stretching, maybe going for a walk. Um, nature is super important to me. Healthy eating, sleep. I'm such a huge fan of sleep. Yes. I need my <laughs> eight and a half hours per day and I get it every day. Um, so those are kind of my main things. And yeah, I make sure that those are my routine and my priorities mm -hmm. and taking time off. Like I said earlier, this is a week off for me. So just finding that balance between work and home. Yeah. I only work four days a week. I do not work evenings. I do not work weekends. Um, I've done evening work. I've done weekend work. I can do it, but it definitely has an impact and a toll on me. Mm -hmm. And I would like to be able to work in kind of my highest capacity for quite a few more years. Um, I'm only 37 and <laughs> I'd like to think I have a few more decades, at least in me. Um, and I think in order to keep that energy in the tank, I need to be pretty balanced in my time at work. Um, and my time away from work because it is it's exciting work it's invigorating but it's also draining in its own way so self-care for me is a, a number one priority mm -hmm. do you have a favorite thing to do for self-care or just everything I think honestly the thing that personally settles me the most is just time outside and just being able to go for like a nice leisurely walk outside yeah. um, really just helps to settle me. It's when I can be the most mindful, the most present and feel the most grounded and relaxed. So that's definitely a go-to for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it difficult for you to separate um, caring for others with taking care of yourself? Actually not. Mm -hmm. And I'm really grateful for that. Like mm -hmm. I do feel like some of this stuff is just built into my DNA. And I'm really grateful for that because I've seen in other people how kind of those separation and those boundaries are difficult for them to accomplish. And I truly don't think anything special that I've done or like actions I've taken. Yeah. I think it's just built into my personality that I am very well suited to be able to sit, witness pain, challenge in other people, but be able to recognize that that's theirs. That's not my journey. That's mm -hmm. not my story. I feel tremendous empathy for people, um, but I really don't feel like I take that on as my own. I think the parts of work that I do carry with me is my own stuff. When I am kind of doubting, did I serve that person in the best way? Did yeah. I do my best job? Um, was that the kind of appropriate way to go about supporting them in that moment? That's the stuff that spills over into those after hours mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, I randomly think about people, I wonder how they're doing, or I wonder how that went, or, you know, I drive by a landmark that they mentioned, oh, and it just puts them in my head. Um, but I don't feel that that pull is unhealthy or detrimental to me in any way. That's just a human connection thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the stuff that lingers is, again, my own my own self-doubt and my own um, worth and shame stuff, um, which is, I think, always going to be a work in progress for me. Mm -hmm. So you've been a psychologist for so long. Is it hard for you to kind of not be that therapist and analyze other people outside of work, like with your friends or your family? Have you had trouble with that in the past? I don't think so. No. Um, that again... I was also reading another therapist talking about this online very recently. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, our work at the end of the day, it is still a job. 
Like we, we usually love what we do and we're very passionate about it, but it's not like our 24 seven way of being. Yeah. Like I yeah. am a person too. <laughs> um, there is a time where I shut my office door and I'm moving on to the rest of my life. So I'm mm-hmm. not hearing that, that professional kind of way of approaching people in my personal life at least I don't think so Um, certainly (laughs) nobody's ever said that to me Um, but I what I do think is cool is that I've learned a lot from just working with clients and helping them with tools that I'd like to think I have taken a lot of those tools and that wisdom and I've applied it into my personal life But I don't think it's just, you know, I'm diagnosing other people or analyzing other people. I'm actually looking at for myself, hey, how can I be an assertive communicator? How could I have handled that differently? How can I show Mm -hmm. up in a role? Um, So I take it as more of a personal development thing than analyzing other people. Um, I mean, occasionally, if I'm just meeting someone in public, not that that's happening right now, but when more social events were happening, um, I might look at somebody and go, yeah, they probably have some issues that they need to look at. But then yeah. that's the end of my thinking yeah. about it. That's yeah. their journey. That's their thing. Now I just have to decide as a person how or if I want to engage with that individual. Right. I'm not their therapist. So their their therapy business is theirs, not mine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Um, what is your advice for people who are struggling with their mental health or mental health issues surrounding the pandemic, whether that's anxiety or depression or financial strain or relationships or anything? Yeah, I'd say a couple of things. Like I would definitely encourage people to look at what they can do differently to support yeah. themselves. So a lot of people right now, they are, I've noticed they're isolating Yes, I know we can't go out and socialize in the same way that we could before, but people are still available to us. Like, look, we're talking right now. We've never met before, but yet somehow in a global pandemic, we found a way to be able to connect. Is it quite the same as if we were sitting at your kitchen table talking? I don't know. It probably is not the same, but it's still a connection nonetheless. So just looking at ways that they can connect um, and also looking at ways that they can just engage with the world a little bit differently. So getting outside um, more, even if it's just passing by someone on a road challenging themselves to say hello or how are you um, rather than just avoiding them and walking because that's the big thing that impacts mental health like nothing else is isolation. And connection yeah. actually doesn't require a lot. And mm-hmm. that's where I think people have some kind of judgments or misunderstandings that connection requires this great effort or this great time commitment or this great intimacy. But there's a lot of value in those so-called loose connections. So even just like a quick conversation with a neighbor or the cashier at a grocery store. Um, These actually do have nutritive and nourishing value for our mental health. But when that cloak is kind of over people, they're not doing those things. So if that's possible for people to do, I would definitely recommend more connection. So Mm -hmm. more loose connection with people in your community, more connection with people that you know, as well as connection with just nature, the outdoors, just actually looking at birds and looking at the wildlife that's out there. Again, that's going to fill people up more than just feeling isolated. Um, And for those who feel that that cloak is just so heavy that they can't gain any traction, I hope that they'll reach out. Like there are the crisis lines available in most cities. And now there's some fairly low cost, like online therapeutic resources that are out there. All cities or most cities have low cost counseling agencies. Mm -hmm. Some people might have benefits available to them. So just start trying to talk to somebody somewhere. Mm -hmm. A lot of people's first contact is a doctor. So going to a walking clinic or talking with a family doctor, hopefully that can start them on a path to just having some professional conversations. So there's the self-management side of things, but then there's also professional support available. And I would say that 
literally everybody on the planet is struggling in a different way and to a greater extent yeah. than they normally would. Mm -hmm. So how I view it is that this pandemic has put some added pressure onto everybody's system. Some of our systems were already kind of just hanging on. So that X pressure has now cracked some of our foundation. So those individuals are likely to be the ones who will need and benefit from that professional support the most um, because they were sort of close to that point of need even before this all began. Some people were already at that point of need. Now there's this extra pressure. So they will need to almost kind of double down on their resources and their supports that they've been engaging in. Whereas others who typically feel pretty mentally healthy and well, um, even still will be finding some wear and tear from everything that's been going on over the last while, compounded with other things that have happened in their lives. So just looking at how you can take care of yourself in small bits, being realistic, um, but also being open to the support that you need is key. Oh, I completely agree with um, the connection. I think... I mean, it doesn't have to be some big elaborate event or with a lot of effort. It can be something small. And I think um, if you're thinking about somebody, somebody pops into your head, send them a little message, just say hi. And I think a lot of people forget that we are in physical isolation, but not social isolation. Absolutely. So there's so much we can do from afar without um, seeing people face to face. Yeah, I'd say some of the more nutritive conversations that I've had over the last mm -hmm. year just happen like outside my door. Like one was after a snowstorm and I was shoveling and a couple neighbors came out and were shoveling and helping. And it was just so nice, like just yeah. that act of kindness, um, a little bit of that connection. And it was all pretty superficial, but it was just really nice. It was different and it was just a human connection um, not to say I haven't had meaningful connections with people that I know and that I love and care about mm -hmm. but those ones stand out to me because they were different and they were completely effortless I didn't create them I didn't have to do any planning they just appeared and mm -hmm. so it's all really cool how those organic opportunities for connection present themselves and I think they're really special I know that um, sometimes mental health issues can be brought on by traumatic events um, or stress, such as COVID. Um, what is your kind of opinion on that? Do you think there's a lot more mental health issues now because of COVID? No, I don't really think that that's no. the case. I think that COVID again, has just been another stressor that's right. put pressure on already kind of risky foundations. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of mental health issues, certainly addiction, is genetic in origin. And I know a lot of people don't like hearing that um, because what that means is that there's not a lot that we can do about its existence mm -hmm. in kind of either exists or it doesn't yeah. uh, have the genetics they manifest through circumstance or they don't um, but once they've manifested there's certainly lots that we can do to take care of ourselves and change their course um, and I think that COVID has just kind of brought forward some of the issues that mm -hmm. were already there for people. And I'm hearing that a lot from new clients who are reaching out to me. They're saying, I've been meaning to do this for a long time, um, but it's only now partially because they have the time. So mm -hmm. there have been some gifts to COVID. People are less kind of rushed and distracted yeah. and busy yeah. with stuff in life that previously kind of kept them skating on the surface, not dealing with the brewing storm underneath. Right. Now they actually have the time to deal with things. Mm -hmm. um, has it brought forward issues that didn't exist for people before? Yeah, most certainly. But in those individuals, I would say that they still had that vulnerability inherent within them that now this stressor basically activated it, right? It's like, like a light switch on the wall. They yeah. had the wiring built in. It's just with this extra pressure and stress, it activated that light switch to be turned on. 
now they will need to navigate that. So it's it's a stressor. It's a global stressor. <laughs> um, but our systems are going through things like this all the time. Um, we have work stress. We have environmental stressors. We have tragedies. We have crises. Um, we just all happen to be going through a common one. But even how we're individually experiencing that crisis is going to look different um, depending on the person. So it's it's kind of interesting from a psychological perspective how how universal this is. Mm -hmm. I think there's been, certainly not in my lifetime, um, anything that's been quite this far-reaching that's impacted everyone to the same extent that COVID has. So it's quite interesting that way. But did it create these mental health issues from scratch, I would not say that that's the case. Mm -hmm. It kind of revealed some of the the cracks that were already there. That was actually going to be my next question. What is your opinion on kind of the nature versus nurture um, perspective on mental health issues? Do you think that it is purely genetic or kind of a mix of everything? Yeah. Yeah, it's both. But I do believe there's an inherent genetic vulnerability for it. And then environment, stress, trauma, exposure to behaviors and substances and circumstances activates that. Mm -hmm. So it is more heavily leaning towards the genetic side. What I've read and what I've seen, about 70 to 80 percent genetic when it comes to addiction. So Mm -hmm. that leaves 20 to 30% still environmental exposure, trauma, stress. So there's definitely that nurture element to it, but there has to be both factors in the mix. And that's always been my take. I'm I'm not a a black and white person that way. Um, I think life and experience is pretty complicated and there's so many different factors that it'll never boil down to just one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I agree. I would agree with that too. Um, okay, if someone is st- uh, interested in starting therapy, how do they go about doing that, and kind of what is involved in in the process of starting with you? Yeah, I do have empathy for people because it's actually pretty overwhelming. There's a lot of different therapists out there. um, And if you're going into the kind of private counseling realm, the world's your oyster, but Mm -hmm. that can be overwhelming, right? When there's so much choice, um, it can almost create that analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. So what I would suggest is, for one, If it's an issue you feel comfortable disclosing to people in your network, it might actually be helpful to just see if anyone has any recommendations of providers that they've used or that they've heard of that they feel some degree of trust with. Um, And even if you don't necessarily connect to that specific provider, maybe that's a starting point that Mm -hmm. you can reach out to that person, have a discussion with them, and they can say, well, this other person might be more appropriate for you. So it just gives you some direction. Um, For two, you can talk with a healthcare professional. So ask a physician, um, or if you're connected to another healthcare professional that you have some trust in, ask them if they have any recommendations or people that they would suggest. Um, Again, just to help you narrow down that pool. For three, if those first two options aren't comfortable for you or aren't available to you, there are lots of good online kind of search resources. Um, People can just start by Googling kind of what the issue is that they're looking to address Mm -hmm. and their local area, and they'll likely get some of the providers who are around them, and then they can start to pick based on geographical location, area of expertise. Um, And there are also kind of designated search engines. The most popular one is through Psychology Today. They have a therapist listing service that I'd say most therapists who are active in counseling practice are listed on. 
And what's cool about that is it gives you the chance to narrow down providers based on a bunch of different things. So you can pick based on gender, as we were talking about before. You can pick based on location, area of expertise. Um, and a lot of providers, they'll offer like an initial consultation, whether that's by phone or by video, just so you get a chance to get to know them. Um, but I would certainly encourage people to do their research. So look at that person's website, um, look at their social media, like really try to get to know them while you before you have that consultation or even before or after just to get to know them because a big part of the effectiveness of counseling is in that therapeutic rapport or that therapeutic relationship so yeah. you have to feel comfortable with the person that you're working with um, or else it's not going to be as effective as it could be so if just using your intuition for other people. I know they're more logical based, but just really trying to look at all the information that's available to you to see how you're feeling about that provider. And there's a lot you'll be able to learn even before you meet with them for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, and also remembering that if you do pick somebody, you have an initial session, you can opt out at any time. So there's nothing that says this now has to be your therapist for life. Um, people change providers. You can recognize after a few sessions that it's not a fit. Go back to searching once again. So really following your level of comfort um, and how you're feeling about that relationship is a big thing that I would encourage people to be mindful of. Mm -hmm. Does someone need a referral to um, start therapy with you or can they just message you or call you and yeah for me no referral is required mm -hmm. um typically in in calgary and in alberta referrals may only be necessary if you're staying within the alberta health system um, if you're going privately to mm -hmm. just seeking a provider most providers would not require a referral um, mm -hmm. so just self-referral just reaching out to them on your own would be mm -hmm. more than adequate Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was looking at my own about, uh, benefits and coverage that I have for therapy sessions, and I found that it was pretty low. Um, and I feel like probably most benefit packages are the same. Uh, do you have any advice or ideas for how the average person can afford therapy? Uh, yeah, it's a tricky one. What I've seen is that a lot of people may try and budget so mm -hmm. they'll find out what their benefits coverage is yeah. and then they'll also try and make some determinations for themselves about any additional funding that they may be able to provide out of pocket for counseling um, and as a therapist myself I'd love to know that information up front because mm -hmm. then that allows us to figure out okay are we be able to adequately work together um, or do we maybe need to look at some different options um, so if people are quite limited in terms of their resources this is where counseling agencies that are more nonprofit that offer lower cost or sliding scale counseling are a great resource um, also looking at behavioral health consultants within your family doctor's office can be a good resource um, looking at the primary care networks that exist in Alberta can be a great resource. Um, and even just accessing like somewhere like Access Mental Health and just talking with them about lower cost resources. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, there are some of these newer like online counseling resources their names at this point are kind of escaping me, um, but places that you can do video counseling appointments for pretty low cost. I think they're maybe like 40 or $50 per session. Um, for some people that's nice and convenient. Um, I don't feel like that's a place where you could build kind of a really strong therapeutic yeah. relationship, but might be able to be helpful with kind of short term symptom management. Um, but yeah, it's a, a challenging world out there. It would be nice if there was greater funding available yeah. for some of the psychologists that right now people have to pay privately for. Uh, I know that the Psychologists Association of Alberta are petitioning and trying to make a push for every Albertan um, to have coverage for up to, I think, five 
counseling sessions per year. Um, but we'll see if that's something that the government ever accepts yeah. or is willing to fund. Um, but that would even be a step up. I know the average, I'd say, benefits coverage is around $500 per year which is exactly what it was when I started doing practicum work in 2008. Um, so that's pretty pathetic to me that for a lot of people, their benefits have not changed in 13 plus years. Um, there are other companies that are more progressive and more advanced. And so I'm starting to see some people maybe have up to $1,000 of coverage per year, which wow. now we're talking is a bit more decent. Yeah. Um, and even others who have more sessions um, available to them throughout the year, which I think is great. But for those who are on more the limited end, there are some other resources out there that they can see. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a couple questions that I like to ask um, every single guest. So I'm just going to see what your opinions are because I love hearing everyone's different answers. Um, what advice do you have for friends or family members of loved ones who struggle with mental health issues? Is there anything that they can do to help? Yes. Um main thing that they can do is engage in their own recovery and mental health care um, rather than just be focused on their loved ones. So the more that you can take care of yourself, the better the outcomes are for the family. Um, they can educate themselves so they can learn about the condition and about how to appropriately support. Because I find that a lot of times loved ones, they step into control and caretaking rather than true support, which involves boundaries and which involves some degree of detachment with love to empower the loved one. Um, but the main thing that they can do is model the mental health behavior and recovery steps that they would like to see their loved one taking to make sure that they're in the healthiest place possible to be able to truly support their loved one. Uh, okay, this one might be a little bit difficult to answer, but I mean, everyone has their bad days. Um, but how do you know if you or someone else is struggling with more than just your average case of the blues? I'd say it depends on frequency and intensity. Okay. So if there's a lot more of those down days than there are not down days, that could definitely be a red flag. And if you're finding that those down days feel like you're like in a, a 20 foot cavern um, rather than just in, you know, a little bit of a, a dip. Mm -hmm. um, so the intensity also tells you that that's a red flag that well, maybe this is something to talk about with a professional to get more of their perspective. Um, but the, the frequency and the intensity, I think, are good ways to, to gauge it. And often, I mean, people, we do compare comparisons not a very accurate thing to do mm -hmm. but you know if you're living with or close to people you can kind of get a sense of how they experience life in the world mm -hmm. um, and if you're noticing hmm, things seem a lot harder for me um, things seem more effortful for me I really struggle with the basics of life just even to get up in the morning or to take care of myself like with hygiene or with nutrition um, then those are usually red flags that people are kind of working against some other inertia internally which often can be a sign of some mental health challenges. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last question for you. Um, is there a stigma or a misconception surrounding mental health that bothers you the most or that you hear most often that isn't true? Uh, I laugh because there's a lot of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How do I boil it down to just one thing? Um, well, I guess since I am a more specialized in addiction, just adding about addiction is, let's say, horrendous, um, that people really do tend to think it's just severe substance use, yeah. Yeah. really downplay and 
I think that this prevents people from seeking out help um, when it's about other behaviors or when it is at a more mild or moderate level, which is too bad because when things are at a more mild or moderate level, there's a lot more benefit to intervention and treatment at that point. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder to treat people when they're at that severe end of the spectrum. But a lot of people, they wait um, because they, they're scared. They think they'll be judged. They think that they won't be treated the same way if they put their hand up and say, I have addiction. And unfortunately, that's true. Like I've had healthcare yeah. clients um, in the healthcare system who hear it all the time, <laughs> um, even quite shamefully acknowledge that they've participated in some of that judgment and stereotyping of patients who have the same issue that yeah. they have. Um, and so there's a lot of change that we need to make towards recognizing that addiction as well as mental health issues, they're symptoms. They're not part of people's personality. They're not their choices. Um, they're not things that people are actively and willfully doing. People do not choose to suffer. Yeah. Um, so if we can work towards more understanding, more empathy, then I believe that starts at the individual level. So if mm -hmm. people can be more open, if people can take care of themselves differently, I do truly believe that that helps at that bigger societal level. Mm -hmm. That is kind of all the questions that I had for you. Is there anything that you wanted to touch on or bring up? I guess I did just want to, when we were talking about mental health not being super accessible, um, I have developed a free, kind of a few free resources to just help give people some kind of information and some education. Mm -hmm. um, one of which is a free ebook on, it's a guide to self care that's on my website. Um, I am also sending out a newsletter every couple of months with just some different links, some different articles, and just different things that people can check out. Um, so all of that's accessible through my website. So if I can plug my website, Absolutely. it's www w.sanapsychological.com mm -hmm. um, and I've also created a YouTube channel um, which I just recently renamed to Go Grow Yourself a little bit cheeky uh, <laughs> so there's just videos on there related to addiction mental health um, and relationships as well as like how to support a loved one with addiction um, so just some kind of those self-help self-management tools which are obviously not a substitute um, for professional assessment and treatment but mm -hmm. can definitely support people in their journey so those are ways and there's lots of other YouTube channels, social media accounts, resources out there that people can certainly access to help them in their journey. Um, but those are a few that I've contributed into the stratosphere. Oh, that's awesome. So if anybody wants um, to reach out to you, ask you more questions uh, or contact you, what is the best way um, for them to do that? I love emails. I'm an introvert. So <laughs> calls still kind of scare me for whatever reason. I have this adverse reaction when my phone rings. I will answer the phone. I will talk to people, but phone calls are challenging because I'm in session most of the day. So mm -hmm. sending me an email um, and my email address is on my website is the best way to get in touch with me. Um, I'm known for being really quick to get back to people. So they can just send me an email and we'll go from there. Perfect. Um, I will add that information to the description of the podcast as well. Um, so thank you. I just want to thank you for coming on and uh, bringing your perspective and opinions and expertise. This has been awesome. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was fun. Um, and all the best in your ongoing podcast. I saw you're already like 10 episodes into it. So that's awesome. But we need to see how it keeps growing and developing. Oh, thank you. I'm super excited to see where it goes to. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Feel free to reach out at any time. You can contact me on Instagram and Facebook at Stomp the Stigma YYC, and you can email me at Stomp the Stigma YYC at gmail.com. If you like the podcast, please like and subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Apple Podcasts. 
And if you or someone you know would like to come on, I would love to have you share your story, speak your truth, and together we can stomp the stigma.